from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Want to save money on pesticides? The answer may be in this lab. It's really kind of a new marriage between nanotechnology and entomology. Better soils isn't just a big issue for the Corn Belt. You know, our organic matter has increased you know, half, quarter percent, which is tremendous in our soil. How farmers in the South are flipping their soils as farmers in the Midwest continue to face drought. Wheat harvest is running ahead of average in states like Missouri. We'll get an update not only on yields, but harvest progress coming up today on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Recent rains have done little to help put a dent in the drought conditions in the Corn Belt. The latest drought monitor showing drought is continuing to expand across portions of Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. Now it shows that just over 27% of the country is in some sort of drought. That's up slightly from the previous week. And you can see where the issues are growing right now in the central part of the country. And that means that now 70% of the corn crop is in drought. That's up 6% from the previous week, along with 63% of the soybean crop, also up 6% from the week before. And we've been asking farmers their thoughts about overall crop production and yield potential as drought conditions grow. A recent agweb.com poll finding 61% of those who responded are getting more worried by the day when it comes to corn yields, 25% aren't sure, and only 15% say they are feeling good about current yield potential. Nationally, wheat harvest is running behind. Now that's largely because major wheat producing areas that suffered through drought this winter are now seeing relentless rains. The only states running ahead are North Carolina and Missouri. Farm Journal's Time Morgan hits the fields to see why wheat harvest is happening at such a rapid pace. Well, in the past few years, wheat really has not been a popular crop to grow in areas like Missouri. But just like other parts of the Midwest, wheat prices did attract more acres this year. The rhythm of wheat harvest is sweeping across western Missouri after a multi-year void on the Nails family farm. The last time we planted wheat was probably six years ago. Just like other farmers across the Midwest this year, the Nails decided to give wheat a try for two major reasons. Summer income and the price was pretty attractive as well. Nail says only about 10% of their acres were covered in wheat this winter, a decision that's paying off on the good ground. The yields on the good dirt, the heavy dirt, have been really good. The lighter soil has struggled. Uh, we were dry at a crucial time and uh, lighter soil really uh, struggled this year. So what's considered good here? 60 to 70 bushel per acre winter wheat. We did have some wheat that was running 80, 90 bushel on the good dirt, but on the you know, lighter dirt, 30, 40 was catching most of that. And for neighboring farmer Tom Waters. Yeah, I like to grow wheat. I just, I like cutting wheat. Wheat has kind of a bad reputation in our area. A lot of people have moved away from it and don't like to plant it, but I still like to plant it. I fertilize the heck out of it and just figure some of that fertilizer is good for the beans too. With a heavy dose of fertilizer across their winter wheat, it's showing up in their yields. We're probably normal, maybe a little above. I think this field's probably gonna be between 80 and 90 bushel. So uh, can't complain about that. A bit of a surprise considering Missouri has seen drought, but it's also prompting wheat harvest to see an earlier start and finish. Maybe uh, a week early. I, I like to cut the last week of, of uh, June usually so uh, we can get the beans planted in a timely manner. USDA says 69% of Missouri's winter wheat crop is already harvested, 18 points ahead of the average pace. And while wheat harvest will wrap up before July 4th, Dryness is now starting to sprout concerns about summer crops. We were blessed with a couple nice rains, but uh, seemed like it shut off now. Showers have been spotty, but enough to aid this year's wheat. Now Waters hopes that rains will come just in time, creating big yields with his double crop soybeans too. Normally I say 35 to 40 bushel, but we can beat that if conditions are right. So if we get, we get 80, 90 bushel wheat and 40 bushel, 45 bushel beans behind it, you know, it works pretty good for us. So where's rain expected as we head into the holiday weekend? We get the latest from meteorologist Andrew Whitmire. Andrew? Yeah, Clinton, taking a look here at the root zone map again, where you see those reds, that's unfortunately pretty much right in the 
heart of the Corn Belt area where again we've been seeing very dry conditions out there and luckily we are going to finally start to see a little bit of a pattern change here as we go throughout this Friday as well as into parts of the July 4th holiday weekend right across parts of the Ohio River Valley and even parts of the Tennessee Valley as well. We're going to be watching for the potential for several rounds of showers and thunderstorms that will bring with it the chance here of some liquid gold from good old Mother Nature here as we go throughout this holiday weekend and just showing you kind of the precipitation estimate here again. We're going to be looking at pockets of heavier rain. Some folks in here will pick up way more than others while well, others are still kind of counting the raindrops, but there is a good deal here across parts Parts of the Corn Belt areas that we keep looking at around two to four inches of water through the weekend. Let's check out your Ag Day photo of the day here from Montrose, South Dakota, and you've heard of the phrase knee high by the 4th of July, haven't you? Well, Steve Lousberry here says his corn is well beyond that. He took this picture out in his field, adding he is 6'3", so obviously his corn not doing too bad despite the drier weather. I'll mourn your Ag Day forecast in just a few. USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack this week announcing another round of spending to expand independent meat processing. Vilsack announcing $115 million in funding to be distributed across 17 states. The awards include $15 million to Mountain West Economic Development in Montana to expand slaughterhouse operations in the state's Flathead Valley and 800,000 that will go toward the Farmers Union Foundation for Smaller Processors in Minnesota, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. The National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is managed by USDA, will also grant seven awards. Those total more than four and a half million dollars to community and technical colleges for the training of meat processing workers. An update on a story we've been following for a while. Several black farm workers in Mississippi who alleged some farms discriminated against them in favor of white foreign workers. Now, the U.S. Labor Department conducting an investigation called Operation Delta Force, finding violations by 44 employers. They include catfish growers and operations that raise crops like rice, soybeans, and corn. The agency claims the employers violated several requirements of the H-2A program, didn't disclose all conditions of employment, failed to provide accurate anticipated hours of work and bonus opportunities, and made illegal pay deductions. It has recovered more than $505,000 in back wages for 161 workers. The employers also paid an additional $341,000 in fines. The announcement comes after two ag businesses in the Delta settled lawsuits filed on behalf of black farm workers. The employees had alleged the farms hired white laborers from South Africa under the H-2A plan, paying them more than the local black employees for the same type of work. Flip Your Soil on Ag Day is brought to you by Economics, farming's go-to information resource. Get your questions answered at nutrient-economics.com. The approach farmers take to flipping their soil to make it more productive depends on where they farm. Today, Ag Day's Michelle Rook introduces us to an Alabama family that has seen gains by making soil health a priority. Implementing soil health practices is more difficult in the Deep South than in the richer soils of the Corn Belt, but it may be even more important for achieving high yields. That's a challenge that's been taken on by the Bridge Force, and they've even turned it into their own brand. We have done several things to improve soil health. In the red clay soils of Alabama, soil health is critical for improving the water holding capacity of fields to sustain crop growth, especially during times of drought stress. And that's why the Bridge Force have been doing strip till since 2002 and minimum and no till since 1996. These practices have gone a long way to improving the organic matter in their soils. You no, know, our organic matter has increased you know, half, quarter percent, which is tremendous in our soil. The Bridge Force have also diversified their rotations. Plus, they grow a wide variety of cover crops, including cereal, rye, wheat, clover, and tillage radishes. They're adding biomass to help improve the soil tilt. Greg says he sees many signs their efforts are paying off. Years ago, when I was younger, when we were doing all the tillage, you would go out and feel you wouldn't find an earthworm. But now you can go out and dig and you can you can frown that for them so that's we know that's a that's a big improvement plus they're getting a yield response generally it's a 10 15 percent yield 
increase. All these practices also allow them to produce their crops more sustainably. The reason Target came to them in 2020 to source sustainable cotton, which kickstarted their own brand. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Now, Michelle will be right back to discuss how the latest round of rains and forecasts for rains are impacting our corn markets. And later, science searches for new ways to improve the use of pesticides. We'll see what K-State researchers are up to ahead. On Ag Day. Corn futures continue to pull back on Thursday as some scattered showers fell across the Midwest, while soybeans went the opposite direction. Michelle Rook is back with more in Markets Now. Grains were mixed on Thursday. Rich Nelson with Alan Dale is with us with analysis. And of course, uh, we have lots of things going on here on Friday. Uh, end of month, end of quarter, first notice day. You got reports coming out plus weather. What is the market going to trade today? You know, I think, of course, uh, issues lined up will be USDA discussions as far as these uh, two interesting reports here from us. And that will give us some good short term discussions for maybe a, a good discussion for the next hour or two trade after. But keep in mind, I think we ought to realize that weather is front and center and will remain so in these next few weeks ahead here. Have things changed that much that we needed to take? all of the risk premium that we have out of this market, Rich? And I, I hate to say it, but these past few days of changing weather forecasts, you know, we're pretty much uh, doing three to six inches of rain for the key areas which needed it directly in front of pollination. So keep in mind with the small relationship that weather in June and May and April has to final yields and the significant relationship it has to uh, weather uh, yields at pollination. Uh, I think this is a very big issue where we are correctly removing a lot of, not all, but a lot of this uh, yield premium here. What about the reports? Average trade guesses on acreage don't show much of a change in terms of what we saw in the March intentions, but quarterly stocks, could we get a big surprise there? And will it verify the tight stocks and strong cash prices we've seen out in the country? And that's a big question. Now for soybeans, the answer is really easy because that feed uh, residual, that miscellaneous use category is so small for soybeans, March, April, May, we probably should not get a surprise there. But the big question is for us on corn, where there's still a good uh, a good deal of, uh, of, of feed residual usage in that pr prior quarter, roughly about 900 million bushels. So we can have a 100, 150 million bushel swing perhaps on that subject. We'll see if it gives, gives us any lasting change in price though. And will we get much change in acreage? And as it stands right now, the trade's not thinking so. And, and I'm agreeing with, uh, agreeing with this as well. So in our viewpoint, we're pretty much looking at perhaps a minor 200,000 acre shift uh, out of corn and into soybeans. At this point in time, though, uh, USDA is probably not going to verify all of that movement. And uh, the big question for us is what type of price response again for us. So it's not going to be enough to really change the general narrative of this year's supply for this year. All right. It's going to be a volatile day for sure. Thanks for joining us. That is Rich Nelson with Ellen Deal, and that's Markets Now. To talk to Rich Nelson one-on-one, -on -one, call 800-262-7538. On this Friday, we will have to watch out for a few ridge riders here. We're going to have to watch out for a few damaging severe thunderstorm warnings, maybe even a few isolated tornado warnings across parts of the Ohio and even parts of the Tennessee River Valley here on this Friday. The good news, though, we don't need any damage, but we do need some pockets of some decent water. And it looks like this will come to fruition here as we end out this week and head forward right down into the July 4th holiday weekend. Notice that boundary that is set up there across parts of the Ohio River Valley. That'll bring with it again some scattered showers and thunderstorms, which will kind of ride right around that boundary here all the way throughout this July 4th holiday weekend. And of course, that will come with it the potential here for some damaging winds, isolated tornadoes, and damaging hail as well. But the good news, though, is that will provide us with some much needed water throughout parts of the corn. Belt. Looking at temperatures this afternoon again, we've been watching that heat dome and that heat dome is going to be unrelentless here as we go throughout the end of June now and entering into July. We're still going to be looking at triple digit heat values all the way up in fact and across the parts of South western southeastern Kansas there and even all the way up into St. Louis Memphis over towards Atlanta going to be dealing with that triple digit heat mark and looking at our temperature outlook here as we begin a new month here 
for Saturday. And as we go all the way past the July 4th the holiday weekend, we're looking kind of at that heat dome, unfortunately trying to remain maybe just a touch on the cooler side, though, up across parts of the uh, western Dakotas. But meanwhile, again, we're going to be looking at July heat out there really into full force here across much of the country. That's a look around the country. Let's take a look here. Ag Day select cities. Going on over to South Bend, scattered showers and thunderstorms throughout the day. High nearing 90 degrees. It'll also be a humid day as well. Dallas right on the hills of triple digit heat. And going over to Salt Lake City, mostly sunny, hot, high 92 degrees. A new approach to pesticides has researchers in Kansas excited about the future. We'll have details next. And later, peel back the layers of what may be the earliest known picture of pizza. We're off to Italy in the country. Registration is open for the 2023 Pro Farmer Crop Tour, August 21st through the 24th. Attend one of our nightly meetings or join online as we gain insight on the 2023 growing season. Visit profarmercroptour.com forward slash register to select the stop nearest you. Kansas State has a new lab that could change how producers use pesticides. It's called Nano Pesticides, and K-State is a leader in this research. Welcome to our nanotechnology lab in the entomology department at Kansas State University. The project we recently started, initiated with the USDA, or NAMBIF. Okay, it's, a, it's really kind of a new marriage between nanotechnology and entomology. What we're hoping to do is look at various pesticides and see if we can reduce the amount of pesticide in the environment, whether through seed treatments or foyer applications or whatever, by using them at the nano level to test nanotechnology with pesticides, looking at seed treatments in agriculture, foyer application, and in the medical world to look at some mosquitoes to see if maybe we can reduce the amount of pesticide applied to various bodies of water and control mosquitoes at the same level that we have been. What I'm looking at is um, how do we take natural materials and use them as a base and put a pesticide on them. Sometimes that pesticide is a natural pesticide. Um, and sometimes it's an inorganic metal. We um, just did a study with mosquitoes using uh, silver and it um, killed the mosquitoes at uh, a lower rate than was previously published. And the reason why silver works is because it's antimicrobial. So what that basically means is that it killed all the bacterial gut in their stomach. And so they, they uh, ended up dying. Uh, the other thing I'm trying to do is make these materials customizable and have more than one function. So if you need a fertilizer and a pesticide in there, you can put it in one thing and make it as cheap as possible. By using uh, agricultural waste also, we're using a product that is thrown away, so we're also uh, driving down that cost. We're actually really pretty excited. We really think in the long term, um, by the time we screen different materials and test different materials, I think it has a really interesting, at least, or a positive future for agriculture and maybe in medicine also. And our thanks to Kansas State for sharing that video with us. Well, if you love pizza, stick around. Up next, we'll show you what researchers believe they've found buried under volcanic history in the country. In the Country on Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. What if you had the nitrogen you need already on seed? Pivot Bio is the first company to apply nitrogen on seed. The nitrogen you need, now on seed from Pivot Bio. Learn more at pivotbio.com. What did pizza look like back in the day? I mean, really far back in time. We may be getting a look. Archaeologists in Italy have discovered a nearly 2,000 year old painting, one that some believe may depict a distant ancestor of the modern day pizza. The fresco depiction was found in the ruins of Pompeii. It shows a round, bready dish topped and flanked by fruits and spices, but without cheese and tomatoes, which weren't available at the time. But Romans during that period did have something called a hearth bread, which was yeast dough made with flour, olive oil, water, and salt, now referred to as focaccia. It's a cousin to pizza. 
Now, no matter what is pictured, it offers up a tasty look at what the buried civilization had to eat. And now we're all hungry. And that's all the time we have this morning. I'm sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.